I'm Love Coach Scott Katamas, and it's a really special edition of my Secret Sunday show. Uh, and I'm going to do very little talking because I've got one of the most interesting people I've ever had on this show. Um, this is Michael Feely, and I'm imagining many of you saw him last night. He was one of our featured keynote speakers on Saturday Night Alive. And this man has so much fascinating information. And I'm really grateful that he agreed to come and be on the show this morning, where it can really slow down. He doesn't have to squeeze it all into 10 minutes. Um, and we can really learn more about his incredible research, um, about history's mysteries, and some of the ancient secrets. So first of all, thank you very much, Michael, for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. Mm, no, thank you again. And thanks for last night. It was a pleasure to be there. Good. Michael, I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'm going to start off with one that may or may not be connected to your research, but um, the last two times I've been to England, I was actually shooting documentaries about crop circles, and I don't recall if it was you or someone else who mentioned Silbury Hill, but I happened to be there the year that the Mayan calendar crop circle happened to cross the highway from Silbury Hill. It was extraordinary. It was huge. Hmm. Um, do you have any thoughts about what the crop circles are. Now, I know some of them are man-made, that we know, but the ones that are more extraordinary, um, that are more mysterious, do you have any thoughts about what they are and what if they are connected to any of your what you've researched? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the main chief that you talk about, I've actually stood inside that. Uh, ironically, when, when I had a day out, it was a birthday treat uh, from my wife and, and I went to a, da a day around the crop circles in Wiltshire and ironically our guide was hosting the BBC camera crew at the same time so we, we were involved in the documentary from, from the BBC on that particular day. The crop circles are extremely interesting because yes of course there are those who claim to make them mm -hmm. but what I found is that the, the rings of planet Saturn are being used to transmit radio signals, which are forming the, the geometric patterns in the landscape. And the reason that they are primarily around Avebury is that Stonehenge in, in a planisphere, all, all the ancient monuments are actually aligned to certain planets and Stonehenge is, is aligned to Saturn. So the rings of Saturn and, and NASA have actually recorded sound waves that, that are clearly messages in, in some kind of ancient uh, extraterrestrial whatever uh, unknown dialect. Now these these radio waves are coming from the rings of Saturn. They are coming through. Now bearing in mind that in light in light speed, Saturn is really one hour 27 minutes in light speed. Now when because radio waves travel at the speed of light because they are electromagnetic radiation, in one hour and 27 minutes, they get from Saturn to Wiltshire in the UK. Why are the majority of crop circles around Wiltshire? Because of Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a radio receiver and it is picking up the radio signals and it is transmuting those into the sound of the environment, which is giving us the pictorial messages. What I've also found is when I've listened to the sounds that are coming from planet Saturn. And I've listened to the sounds that have been extracted from the geometric shape of crop circles. They are a pitch for pitch match. Wow. And I, I do have recordings of, of both of those uh, on, on, a, on another computer, but they are a pitch for pitch match. So if you imagine the guitar strings, the rings of Saturn are being used as, as, as like uh, guitar strings, and they are transmitting these radio signals with messages and there are messages inside these radio waves. And when you look at the great composers of the past, Mozart, Bach, they used to encrypt messages within their symphonies to their family. And their family were actually extracting the encrypted messages from within sound waves. And, this, and these are the famous composers of, of, of the past. So we, we have radio waves that have sentences, that have words, that have meaning that are traveling in the radio waves and they are formulating into a geometric pattern. So when, for, for, for argument's sake, when we actually look at a beautiful geometric snowflake, that shape is the shape of the environment. 
that is so so the Greeks used to call crop circles and whatever they used to call them frozen music. So what is happening is the the, the beauty of the sound of the environment is actually being transmuted into a frozen shape, which is the snowflake. The exact same thing is happening with crop circles. What I've also found is within crop circles, there are what are known as diatonic ratios. And diatonic ratios are unnatural sound waves. So in other words, it is a language. So if you can actually decipher these sound waves and extract the language within the sound waves, you can actually speak a language and you can actually decipher the messages that are being sent. So the planet Saturn is, is, is largely a uh, pinnacle and who is sending them? Well, a lot of these planets, for, for argument's sake, planet Mars is really a halfway point. It's, it's almost like stopping halfway through a journey to, to refresh, to, to have something to eat. Uh, when you look at the likes of, of Avebury, Avebury in Wiltshire by Stonehenge is an exact map overlay of the Sidonian city on Mars. When you look at the, the likes of the face on Mars, within its two-dimensional coordinates, longitude and latitude, it tells you how to find Stonehenge in the UK. Stonehenge in the UK through mathematical coordinates tells you how to find the face on Mars and the Sidonian city. This then brings in other monuments around the world, such as the Great Pyramid, which again tells you how to find the Sidonian city on Mars. So we have this wonderful matrix of mathematics because the, 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 the universal language is mathematics and it is numbers. So it stands to reason that they are using mathematics as a navigation system to find various locations on Earth and beyond. But the crop circles themselves are messages and they are the messages of the planets that are forming into beautiful in, in, intrinsic messages on, on the landscape. This is fascinating. I'm, I'm so appreciating your, that I happen to go in this direction because that's the most logical, resonant explanation for crop circles I've ever heard. Um, other than my wife who passed away, but at the time her theory was that it's a kindergarten class in an extraterrestrial planet doing an art project. That was that was her theory. But um, other than my, my beloved deceased wife's theory, that's just, that, that was powerful. I, and, and it's interesting that you, I just wanna say, I happen to stay in Avebury. There's this little two bedroom uh, Airbnb and we happen to stay in that space when we went to that area uh, the second time that I was doing my crop circle thing and then my wife was with me. And the stones at Avebury were fascinating to us. And, you know, of course everybody's going to Stonehenge, but it was like, wow, there's this incredible pattern of stones in Avebury that we walked around and that felt very significant to us. And there's nobody there. Stonehenge is, you know, busloads and, and there's nobody there. So what about that pattern of stones in Avebury? What you mentioned it briefly just now, but that relates to, did you say Mars or? Yeah, you, you have uh, Silbury Hill in Avebury. <clears throat> now Silbury Hill is basically in planospheres again, it represents Earth and Mars. So when you look at the side down in city, you have on Mars, you have a hill called the Altar of Witness, which is an exact replica of Silbury Hill in Avebury. And hence you have the, the exact map overlay of the two. And it is, for me, these, these ancient monuments are, that they mark where the, the, the two worlds meet. And they, they are basically interdimensional portals. Now, when you go to the, the Great Pyramid, for argument's sake, and you, you see above the entrance that is a double chevron. Now, a double chevron comes from Shibua, which means where the two worlds meet. So they have all of these things planted on, on Earth's energy centers, and they are literally where the two worlds meet, and they are, they are gateways, they are portals. And when I, I took a, a group to Stonehenge, the, the inner circle of Stonehenge as a tour, uh, because I like to go to ancient sites physically there with people and, and point out different things. Now, when I was there, one of the ladies who was uh, my co-host for, for this event just sporadically left the group walked even closer to the inner circle and started doing all of these tonal rules with her voice harmonics with her voice now she I, I spoke to her later and she didn't even she didn't even know she just just did it now when she did all of these different vibrations with her voice the stones of stonehenge sang back and they were reverberating 
in a circle and they were reverberating energy back towards the group. Now, when you, everybody has cell phones and, and we have ringtones, well, of course, these are ringstones and they are vibratory ringstones, ringtones, and they are really keys to the vibratory matrix of this reality. Now, because they are voice activated, they are being activated by, by the masters of sound. If you can imagine my co-host who has no experience in this, walking up to the inner circle, singing to the stones and the stones are singing back. Can you imagine if you have, you know, the high priests and priestesses who understand the masters of sound, what kind of thing they would get back? And in just confirmation of that, in 1971, in August 1971, police were called to Stonehenge. There were five males in the inner circle of Stonehenge and they had a campfire, they had a tent. And as the, the police, police officer approached or got somewhere near, he was accompanied by a farmer who had obviously called. He was the caller. Now, as the farmer and the police officer observed this group of five men, they saw a flash of light, they heard a scream, and the men have disappeared and have never been seen since. Yet the tent remained and the campfire remained, but the five men inside the inner circle of Stonehenge have never been seen since. These, these are portals, they are gateways, they are voice-activated wormholes to two different places. And the Great Pyramid is, again, we, we discussed a little bit last night with the various guests about how the Great Pyramid is really, the for, for me, the, the pinnacle, the, the epicentre of this old network. Now, these ancient civilizations were never a separate individual culture. They were all working in unison because of mathematics and because of theme. When you look into the true meaning of, of what these monuments are telling us, they're telling us about human potential, human consciousness, the transmutation of DNA through sound. That is how we get the elongated skulls. That is how we get the, the different tonal uh, sounds of, of, of these voice activated pyramids because they are sound and again alluded last night is when, when you do sound experiments in the likes of the Chilanadi uh, plates which is when you put sand on a plate and you introduce sound and that sound makes the sand form into various geometric shapes now you can see this all over youtube it happens but at 432 hertz it creates the shape of the tetrahedron the pyramid so if you were to introduce on a large enough scale, 432 hertz, you would create the tetrahedron shape. And this is how I think that the pyramid was actually created. And I found a lot of, well, other people have found codes in the pyramids and I've deciphered them. And some of the, the codes that I've deciphered lead me to believe that the universal mathematical creator is the one who put them there. Because there's such, such advanced mathematics inside these monuments that I think it's beyond human potential really and when we look at the likes of you know the the heads of easter island when we can just see the heads and not the bodies what is that really telling us they are telling us to concentrate on the divine mind and not a body of senses that is why you can only see the heads of easter island it is concentrate on the divine mind not a body of senses and there's lots of other mathematics in there the number 33 uh, the, the statues are 33 feet high that leads you all the way to Jacob's Ladder, which is the spine, which has 33 vertebrae. The 33rd vertebrae is known as Atlas. Atlantis means the island of Atlas. Then you then start going into the head, which is the island of Atlantis, which is consciousness. So we have all of these, these key pinnacle messages that have been left for us. And as I said, when I've put a map over the human head over the Great Pyramid, I have found that they're actually marking the consciousness, the free consciousness systems of the human head. And here is that consciousness system. So now you can see that where our pineal gland is, is where they put the king's chamber. Oh. Where, where we see the pituitary gland is where they have the queen's chamber. Now that little tower looking thing, that is the jet pillar. That is the spine of Osiris. The spine of Osiris basically means to shine, to give light. It is talking about consciousness the, the the great pyramid represents the human mind and they have marked the endocrine system of the human mind now the endocrine system again is the pineal gland the pituitary gland and the thalamus and they give a, a secretion that secretion is yellow and white or golden white that is the land of milk and honey 
that is the consciousness within the mind. So they are leaving us all of these clues. And many people wonder what the subterranean chambers mean of the Great Pyramid and, and, and the great scholars of Egypt do not know. The, the subterranean chambers represent the subconscious mind. <sighs> the subconscious mind is 95% of your thought. Now, where, where do we get the word thought or how do the Egyptians depict thought? A teote, tough, which is an abbreviation of thought. They are, they are telling us about our potential. Now, when we see the, 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 the likes of the Sumerian scrolls, the Anunnaki scrolls, and we see people looking up at giants, they are not looking at giants. They are looking at their potential to be giants. And it is telling us that we are the gods or we are the potential gods again. And when the Egyptians would, and, and, and other ancient uh, cultures were doing all of these rituals, sound rituals, they were able to walk the stars and they were able to surpass the eye of Orion. They were able to come back as the shining ones. They were the higher potential of human. And that is what we are capable of, but they were doing certain rituals. And going back to the vibratory keys of, of, of reality, I've actually come up with a mathematical formula for the speed of reality. Now that speed of reality is really the, the square root of time times the speed of thought. Now, when I was doing this mathematical formula for the speed of reality, there was this one extremely long number that was that just kept popping up and just kept catching my eye, the longest number in the whole of the formula. What I didn't realize at the time until later research is that long number for my mathematical formula correlates to the frequencies of the Great Pyramid. Now, you have the Great Pyramid that is on top, the, 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 the Giza template is on top of an eight by eight grid. Now, eight times eight is 64. Those are the 64 keys of Enoch. Mm -hmm. Because en Enoch in Egyptian is Parhanok, uh, which is Phoenix, the rise of the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have all of this, this ancient culture all around the world are completely joined together. Again, they are not only mathematically given their own precise location, but they're also mathematically given the location of other monuments around the world. They are radio receivers, they are markers of the two worlds, and they are portal opening gateway uh, devices, and they are vice activated through sound. And, and it's a real fascinating world. Uh, and again, what I realized is going into this, looking at each, each culture as if it was a, a, an individual culture, uh, you know, the, the Sumerians uh, by themselves, the Babylonians, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, all being separate. But what I soon found is that they were not all separate because they were all talking about the same things. They were all speaking from the same knowledge base, but they were all encrypting that knowledge within characters. And that is exactly what has happened in the likes of all the great religious books of the world. If you look at them at their deepest level, they are telling you and giving you the same message as the monuments and the monoliths. If you wish to read them at a superficial level, then you get Noah's Ark is a wooden boat, mm -hmm. but that is not the level at which it was written. Right. That is the level at which it's, uh, at which it's taught. Mm -hmm. The level at which it's meant to be is really an ascension book. And that is the same for the Quran, the Torah, the Bible. They are all ascension books if you read them at the correct level. When I look further into that, you realize that Egypt was the original Bible, which was then corrupted by the, the likes of the Levites and, and the, the Kabbalah which then became later Christianity. So the, the Dead Sea Scrolls tell you that the Great Pyramid is Noah's Ark. Now, when you start looking into the story of Noah, you soon realize that, yes, it is. You know, the three levels, the, the, three, the, the three sons of Noah, where you have uh, Ham. Ham means Egypt. When you look at uh, Shem, it is Nashimar, which basically is breathing technique. So breathing... Spiritas, spirituality, it is breathing techniques. And the reason the likes of the Sphinx has no nose is because they are telling us we have lost our spirituality. We have lost our breathing. Now, when you look at Japhet, who is the third son of Noah, Japhet means expanded understanding. So again, we are looking at the Noah's Ark story, the arcane knowledge, that the knowledge that is only known by the few. Noah comes from Nuhak in, uh, in, in Hebrew. Nuhak is related to the Sabbath, to Shabbat the number seven. 
What is the number seven? It is the completion of the chakras. So they are, they are telling us again about the Nawaz art, the arcane knowledge, how those who know this knowledge are saved. They are the saviors. And the ones who don't know this knowledge are the fallen ones. They are lost. So we have a much, a much deeper biblical teaching. And Moses, what, what is the Moses story telling us? Well, again, in, in, in esoteric realms, when you go from, from Egypt to captivity, which is the, the, the lower chakras of self, and you follow your spiritual will, your Moses, you take the path of least resistance to consciousness. Your spiritual will takes you through the path of least resistance to the promised land, the consciousness. What is the path of least resistance in esoteric terms the path of least resistance is known as the open sea that is the red sea parting mm -hmm. for moses it is the path of least resistance to knowledge to the promised land to wisdom wow. so we, we, we're all taught we, we, we are they are telling us but but what they are doing is they are misusing the keys of knowledge and they are keeping it away from the masses and they are keeping these keys of knowledge to themselves for self power for self benefit mm -hmm. and they have hidden all the sacred mysteries so when you when you have the likes of the bible telling you that thou shalt not steal what it's really telling you in, in a deeper sense is that those who have stolen this sacred knowledge from the people mm -hmm. are the thieves mm -hmm. they have stolen your knowledge from you your rightful knowledge and they have taken that from you and they are basically killing your spirituality. Thou shalt not kill. So all of these things have, have a deeper meaning. But in essence, each of these, these cultures are talking about enlightenment and human potential through genetics, through spirituality, through living in Eden, living in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is a static state of mind. In other words, focus. Now, Eden is paradise. What does paradise mean? Paradise beyond division. So when you are beyond division and you are living in, in a focused static state of mind, you are concentrating on your spirituality. You are living in paradise. Now, when you start introducing the devil into this, devil is diablos, which means to divide and to conquer. So what you are doing is you are now splitting your mind into duality you are not having a focused static state of mind now when you start splitting into duality it becomes doubting thomas mm -hmm. thomas didymus didymus means twin it is the twin mind it's the dualistic mind mm -hmm. so they are telling you to concentrate and to focus on the static state of mind because that is where your spiritual power lies uh, i've got to come in for a moment this is so amazing and i'm taking about five questions for you and we've got some from the audience so and what you just were talking about thank you because i've always thought that the adam and eve story is an analogy for when we're in what you might call the astral plane or heaven we're not in polarized reality we're in the one the awareness of oneness we're in paradise the awareness of oneness and that eating the apple represented <clears throat> humankind falling into the state of duality start you know falling into polarization and obviously at this time planet earth is all about polarization where there's up down right wrong masculine feminine for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction so that to me was always what that story meant so thank you for kind of giving that spin on it i've got a question from the audience i gotta ask but way back, you said something that I got chills on, and I really want to ask you, tell us more about what you called the universal mathematical creator. You said it very fast, but I got like a lightning bolt of, whoa. What? Tell, tell us about that. When, when you look at the universe, and I, I look deeply into quantum mechanics and quantum physics to, to, sort of, to, to such an extent now that I'm actually getting quantum mechanical uh, formulas into my head and i'm writing them down and, and i think that it's it's a physics that we've not come across yet it, it's, it's all to do with angular velocity and, and space travel and this is coming into my head from from somewhere when you look at the universe now now when, when you when you mention god 
automatically, regardless upon what religion you are, you, you assume God is, you know, your Allah, your, your Jehovah, your Yahweh. But the God of the Bible is not the God. The true God, even though the, the name God has been monopolized, is the mathematical supreme mind that has created what we know as this universe. Now, that, that creation, before you create anything, you have to think about it. So Genesis means in the mind. Now, when you look at the word in, in, in cipher, which again, it is all to do with, with code and, and attaching numbers in place of letters. So when you look at cipher, the word in equals 51. Now, the interesting thing is, is, the, is the angular slope of the pyramid is 51.51. So in the beginning, in Genesis, is in the mind, because the Great Pyramid, as I said, represents the mind. Now, we have to think about things before we can create it. When you look at the, the, the way in which the universe is, is constructed, it is a mathematical program. It is a mathematical sequence from the smallest of subatomic particle to even smaller to the largest nebula of space. Everything follows a mathematical program, a mathematical formula. So that has been created by a mathematical programmer. Now, when my, my theory on this is we were all part of the undivided mind. Mm -hmm. And as all part of the undivided mind, whatever you can see in creation, you created because you were part of the original undivided mind. Now, as a result of the experience of, of what we've created, we have separated into branches, into universal branches uh, to experience what we originally created, because this has been created from outside of time. So some people, t time is, is atomic. It is the, the oscillation of the cesium atom. So before the atom was created, there was only infinity. So when somebody is, is aged 80 and somebody is aged 20 and they turn around and say, well, I came to Earth before you, that's not correct because we all separated at the same time from a place of no time. And we, we created this universe through, through mind, through a manifestation, through mind. Now, when you start looking at the universal composition, that the universe is, is observer dependent. So in other words, when we focus on something, we are collapsing the wave function. And this comes into the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of science, that things are created, things are in existence because we observe them into existence. Now, to, to put that into, into layman's terms, if I'm holding a dice in my hand, the, the dice has six sides. So there are now six possibilities, six probable outcomes. When I roll the dice, and let's say for argument's sake, the number five appears, the number five is now the manifest and all the other five faces have now become zero possibility. So when we observe something into existence, we are collapsing the wave to see physical reality. Mm -hmm. Now, believe it or not, we never actually see the outside world because what we see that the true reality is the waveform, the wave function, just, just waves going through, going through space. What happens is with our five senses, our five senses take that data from the wave pass it to the brain and the brain creates a familiar world based on that wave. So what we're actually seeing is the brain's deciphering of a wave. A lot of the time, the brain is doing that from memory. It's filling in the gaps of what should have been there based on what you saw previously. And, you know, when, when you read something, sometimes you, the, the, the word is spelt wrong or there's, there's, a, there's a word missing but you don't see the word missing right. because you expect it to be there. Yes. That the brain is telling you that that's there. So that's really how we see reality. So we never really see the true out, out there world. When we go out and look at the stars at night or the planets, we see them as in the outside world. But in reality, they are on the surface of your retina. Hmm. That is how you are seeing them. So when I talk about the universal creator, I'm talking about the mathematical genius that has put this into a mathematical cycle and everything is in a cycle. So that then leads you into another argument of is, is, is reality, is life determinism or is it free will? Mm. Because if, if everything is set into a cycle, then that is determinism because you will fall into one of those cycles and your existence will formulate with that cycle and that circle. And I went into the importance of the circle and Christ and the church uh, last night, but the mathematical genius that has put all this into, into a mathematical formula 
is what I mean by the mathematical creator. Now, sometimes when I'm I'm asleep at night, I get mathematical formulas coming to my mind. And the last one, when I it, it took me the next day to work out what it meant, but it took me back to ancient Egypt. All I had was the symbol of the square root and the numbers 937. When I looked into the square root of 937, it took me into ancient Egypt. It took me into the B uh, because the, 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 the hive, the hexagram of the hive is important in Egyptian royalty, you know, because it, it's an ordered society. The, the, bee, the, the beehive is an ordered society, you see, and the hexagram is wisdom. Now, when you, when you go to the likes of Rosalind Chapel in Scotland, it is set to the gestation temperature of a beehive. And when, when it's that, that temperature is reached, you have the octave of 432 hertz, which again is what I was saying is the, is the frequency that I believe created the pyramids. Now, the importance again in the Christ story of 432 hertz is in cipher, when you look at the, the, the numerics of Jesus Christ, it is all to do with 432 hertz and also 864, which is 432, 864, that is the, the radius and the diameter of the sun, the pi in the sky, which is Christ, the light of the world. Now, there are 43,200 seconds in 12 hours. There are 86,400 seconds in 24 hours. This is the movement of the sun. It is 432 hertz, 43,200 seconds in the minute. A frequency, it all has to do with the diameter of the sun. This is mathematical genius that has put all this together. And when you look at, again, as I was saying yesterday, when you look at the, the cipher for the name Horus or Yeshua, it equals 2160. 2160 is the amount of years the sun spends in each zodiac sign. So we have Christ, which is the sun, ironically in cipher equals number 13. And you have the, the 12 signs of the zodiac, which are the 12 disciples that tell the story of Christ going through the transit. Now, the word Horus gives you horizon. Mm. Uh, it gives you horoscope. So when you start looking at the transit of Horus through the zodiac, Horus horoscope is talking about astronomy. So the, the ancients who, uh, who we call prophets were actually astronomers who were reading a celestial narrative. And it's all to do with the transit of the sun, the, the, the great pie in the sky, the great seed. And the God of the Bible is the serpent. It is Satan. It is not the true creator. And that is where people are being debunked into false belief, into, into false light. Mm -hmm. So question just in terms of the mathematical creation of our universe, would you say that the Big Bang happened when a very sophisticated computer program hit enter? The Big Bang, if it happened, and, and there's evidence to suggest it did, was not a random event, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It was a controlled explosion. And when when you look at, how, again, the, the, the universe, how, how, do, how do things occur? You know, when... When a, a particle or subatomic particle in a state of superposition, which is in multiple positions at once, it can be a wave, it can be a, a particle, it can actually decide which one it wants to be. So that, that gives you a consciousness and intelligence of, of, of atoms. But when they interact with the environment in, in, in a condition of superposition, they create branches. Branches are slightly different versions of the same thing. So the part of the universe that we can see and the part of the universe that we cannot see are slightly different versions of the same thing. Hmm. Now, 5,000 times a second in time inside your body, these branches are occurring by atomic collisions. Say that again, 5,000 times? 5,000 5, times every second there are the creation of branches inside your body through atomic collision. When you, for, for argument's sake now, you just, just go and get a banana out of the fruit bowl invisible to the eye, but 15 times a second, that matter is producing a spark of light. That spark of light is called something else. Something else is antimatter. You then start getting into parallel existence into other worlds because they are basically different versions of the same thing. Now, quantum physics tells you that if the universe that you cannot see 
is the same as the, the bits of the universe that we can see, then there are multiple versions of you across the cosmos. Not you, but versions of you. Right, right, right. Okay, I, I promise some of our people that I'm going to get to the questions. So um, Karen Carrieri um, writes, this is amazing to me, for I've been studying this through my search for Mary Magdalene and my South France trips. Um, and all of what Michael is saying is really clicking. Um, so she has some questions about what your thoughts are about the Ark of the Co Covenant, is the Ark a code, and what you have to say about Mary Magdalene. Okay. The Ark of the Covenant is the brain because it is a, an electrical receiver and transmitter. Now, it is the cosmic aerial between you and the divine. So the, the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant is the contract. It is basically the human brain, which is the electrical receiver from, from you to the cosmos. When you look at the Thebes in, in Egypt, it means the city of the Ark of the Covenant. So again, taking that back to consciousness, to the Egyptian philosophy, they're talking about the brain, the mind, the right. pyramid, the endocrine system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, so it's a relay system between you and the cosmos. When you start looking at Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene is the Yoni. It is the, it is the gateway of birth into this reality. Now, how you do that is when you get two circles and you put them together into the shape of the vesica Pisces, which when you go to Glastonbury and you see the tour and you walk around the gardens, you see the vesica Pisces all over the place. <clears throat> the interlinked of the vesica Pisces, the two circles, incidentally, 360 plus 360, 720. In Hebrew, 720 comes from Arad, which means the son of God. But when you put the two circles together, <clears throat> the vesica Pisces, the inside, the mandala is the yoni. It is the birth, the gateway. Now, the ironic thing is when you look at the, the, the vesica Pisces, the, the in, in, in a ring, it has a width of 153 as a diameter. 153, Mary Magdalene in Greek has a, 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 a numerical value of 153. Now, why is 153 important? Christ caught 153 fish with the disciples. His ministry lasted 153 days. Now, let's take that to Egypt. The entrance level of the Great Pyramid is on the 17th course level. So how does that relate? You add up all the numbers from 1 to 17, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, it equals 153. Now, when you go inside the Grand Gallery, it has 153 steps, and it is 153 feet long. When you look at Ano Elohim, it means I am God. It has the numerical value of 153. So there's all of these, the, the number 153, Mary Magdalene, the womb, the Holy Grail is the womb. It is the gateway into this matrix. <clears throat> so when you look at the, the church, they call Mary Magdalene a whore, a prostitute. You have to go back to ancient Hebrew to understand what it means, because whore means something different to what we believe it means. Whore means kwedeshah, which means holy. Oh. It's the Holy Grail the Graal, the vessel of God, the, the gateway into this reality, into this physical reality. So just to be clear, Mary Magdalene is the Holy Grail in, wow. Yes, wow. The, the Holy Grail is, is Mary Magdalene, which is the womb, which is the, the womb. Right, 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 right. It, 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 it is the, the Graal, the, the, the vessel of God, the gateway into this world. Now, from your perspective, and of course it's it's speculative, but do you believe that historical figures like Jesus and Mary Magdalene actually lived? Um, or do you believe that it's all just kind of become a mythology <clears throat> to help us understand on an archetypal level our world? For me, as physical beings, they they never existed because Jesus is really the solar myth and what they have done is, is, is they are, they have, again, the, the work of geniuses, they have taken solar mathematics and they've hidden it within a character mm -hmm. and they've done the same with, with different biblical characters. So could there be uh, an, an energy that is associated as Christ? Yes, of course. But did the physical Christ walk as a man? No. When you look at 
the only scrolls that have not been filtered by the Roman Church are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written at the time that Christ supposedly walked the earth. They never mention him once. Now, because the Romans wanted all these, these scrolls and they, they, they brought in Jewish mystics, mystics to actually write, and they, they wrote through Hebraic typology. So in other words, the, the Romans studied the, the, the Jewish scrolls and they imitated them using Jewish mystics to fool those of Judaic faith to believe that it was written by certain people and is actually orchestrated by the Church of Rome. The only scrolls that they didn't get hold of was the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Knights Templar took some of those common cave scrolls and they hid them. Now, I found where they've hidden them inside Roslyn Chapel. And I've done that by taking a, a map of Scotland, overlaying it over the layout of Roslyn Chapel, and it marks the spot where these common scrolls are hidden. These are these are the scrolls that the Roman Church wanted to, do, to doctrine and to, to doctor and, and to, to forge. So these characters, no, you know, there, there are pe people with, with high frequency vision mm -hmm. and some, some people, you know, the, the likes of Ezekiel that saw the chariot. Chariot in Hebrew is the Merkabah, etc. It's, it's, it's the vehicle to a higher realm, basically. But, but there were those with the, the higher frequency vision. And when you have high frequency vision, you do see manifestations of etheric energy. So when, for, for argument's sake, you have the planets, the planets communicate, but they are at angles of arc. They are the arc angles. So you have these universal energies that are archangels, but they are the arcs and the energies, the manifestations of planetary energy. And that is the same with angels. It is the, the universal field, which is, which is at angles. We have angles of light. You know, we are the fallen angels because we have lost our knowledge. Did mm. these characters exist now i mean at this point i'll just bring again if you can't see this i used this last night uh when you look at i've already spoken about 432 and when you get hebrew and greek geometry of jesus christ the greek is 2368 and the hebrew is 754 when you divide those two you get 3.14 which is pi Aye, you know yeah. in other words the circle the circle gives us sirs which gives us church. So the body of Christ, the circle, is the church. Now, when you look at the Christian cross, you can see at the bottom there, that really marks not only the, the four cardinal points. Now, cardinal means card, cardalis, which is the doorway to knowledge, but it also marks the four cardinal points, but also the four beasts of revelation, which is your eagle, Scorpio, Aquarius, which is man, Leo, which is the lion, and Taurus, which is the ox, those are the four beasts of Revelation. It is also what the Sphinx of Egypt represents as well. Now, when you take the letters Scorpio, Aquarius, Leo, and Taurus, get the first letter of each of those words, S-A-L-T, salt. Salt gives you sal, which is salvation. So in Gnosticism, knowledge is your salvation, not faith. So these characters didn't work. Now, when you look at the likes of documented comments, Pope Leo said that it has served as well this myth of Christ. The current Pope, Pope Francis, said in 2017, Jesus is metaphorical. Really? This is the Pope. This is the Pope. Now, this is the Pope that has on, on, on the papal throne and also the triple crown of, of, of the Vatican. It's, it, it says instead of the son of God, instead of the son. Vicarious Philly Day, instead of the son of God. So they're basically worshipping something under the guise. So you have the solar cults, you have the Saturn cults, and you have Mother Mary, which is Lucifer, the queen of heaven. Now, when you look at the word Lucifer, it, it comes from hell, hell. But when you go deeper from the word hell, hell, H-E-L-E-L, -L, it gives you yell, hell. Yell, hell means to wail, to cry. Now, the Luciferian invocation is a cry for him that he has fallen for you. That then brings you into the wailing wall of Jerusalem. Wail, cry for him, cry for Lucifer. Now, the importance of that is the wailing wall is not sacred in Judaism. 
but it is sacred to the Roman church because it's actually the, the, the brickwork of a Roman fort for Mark Antony. Mm. Now, the fort was a shrine to Venus, which is Lucifer, which is the female aspect of Saturn. Mm. So why, why do priests wear black gowns and judges wear black gowns? It is satanic brotherhoods. And again, it, there's, so, there's so much planetary influence. You know, when you look at who is Jehovah, who is Yahweh, it is the serpent mm. who, who colluded with the Roman church to write the Jewish scriptures, the Levites. What does Levite mean? Leviathan, serpent. What does Vatican mean? It means a couple of things. The Vaticanus, the serpent. The great serpent. Wow. So, and so we have all of this infiltration. You know, when did was Christ born on the twenty fifth of December? Not the Christian Christ. No, that was Sol Invictus. And the Romans wanted to to Christians to worship what they believed to be Christ, but they're actually worshiping a Roman cult. Now, when again, when you look at what the Sphinx of Egypt looks at, the horizon, and it looks at different planet formations, it looks at X, Y, and Z. Uh, axis coordinates, which are how they were creating gateways as well, which is the last three letters of the English alphabet, X, Y, Z. What the Sphinx looks at is all of these, the, these, these changes, really. And when, when it looks at Orion, just above the hand of Orion, you will see a star. Now, in Egyptian, the word star is SBA, which means doorway, gateway. That is the silver gate of heaven. Now, the importance of that is when you look at the Vatican City and you look at Jerusalem, it is aligned to the silver gate of heaven. So he who controls Jerusalem can, controls the gates of heaven. Oh. And that is, why, that is why it is such a hotbed of, of disturbance, because they want to control. Now, the silver gate is how we, our souls exit and enter this reality through the silver gate of Orion. It is the underworld in Egypt. It is now, the silver I, I just got to come in for a moment about that part because I've got a question. Before he passed away, I did uh, some television shows with Zachariah Sitchin. And one of his main points was the reason that Jerusalem was such a significant place was that it was a um, early landing site for extraterrestrial and that underneath the Holy City, they found these enormous stone, huge 650 ton stone pillars they couldn't possibly be pulled over. They, they, how they would get there makes no sense. So just while you're on the Holy City and talking about that, how does that correlate with some of Zachariah Sitchin's theories? What I found Zachariah Sitchin has, has done is a literal translation of the scrolls. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's universities around the world that have, that have done the exact same literal translation and come up with the same story. Now, if I was to, to hand somebody a Bible and automatically they, they would read from, from Genesis onwards, but they're reading it wrong. Because when you look at Hebrew, it goes from right to left, not left to right. So mm -hmm. you should be reading it back to front. When you read it back to front, i.e. The, the five books of Moses, which is from, Deuteron uh, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, read it from Deuteronomy to, to Genesis wow. because you get a completely different word. So when you look at how... Everything is, is, is a cycle, a circle. The end is beginning and the beginning is the end. Mm -hmm. So Genesis, the beginning is also the end. So when you read it that way, you get a completely different translation. So what, what I think Zachariah has done in, 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 in many respects has made a literal translation of the Sumerian scrolls. Mm -hmm. uh, what I have found is that the Sumerian scrolls, again, there is a deeper meaning to them. People are not looking at giants. They're looking at themselves as potential giants, giants of scale. When you look at, you know, Nibiru, well, in Samaria, the, the orbit of Nibiru, we are told, is 3,600 years. Mm -hmm. But how do the Sumerians write a large circle? 360 degrees. It, it's basically 360 is a large circle in the Sumerian language. So we're talking about a cycle again. Now, when you look at, the, the picture of the Sumerian tablets where you have what looks to be a spinning wheel with the, the eight uh, spokes. That is the, the circuit of the dragon. That is an ecliptical event of consciousness that is marked in orbit of the stars. So when you look at the, the, the Sumerian tablet that looks to be, and people say it is early depictions of the solar system, when you have the, the spheres around what looks to be like the sun in the middle, 
that is not the solar system that is genetics that is the hexagram the nucleus of the the, uh, the hexagram inside the body which has it's, it's now in the the i ching the chinese divinity book as the uh the corn basically uh the the kun queen which is heaven and earth it is the hexagram 11 that is what is being depicted is is telling you that inside your dna there is a nuclear explosion which is either a nuclear fission or a nuclear fusion that is the hexagram 11 which is from heaven to earth so the anyanaki are ourself the shining ones we are all watchers what does watcher mean watcher is the same family of words as bishop which means he who is awake a watcher means he who is awake now what does nephilim mean nephilim comes from nephal which means to fall short or to cause other people to fall short what is falling short it is sin what is sin it is an archery term where you miss the bullseye that's the mark right what what is the bullseye it is knowledge so those who don't have the knowledge are sinners those who have the knowledge can never be sinners now when you start analyzing the names of the different anunnaki gods you know you have anu well anu means divine personification of sky so when we have anunnaki in certain languages it means life from the stars that is our self mm-hmm. and i'll go into the science of that in a moment if you wish but that is ourself. Now, when you look at likes of Alalu, who was meant to be the supervisor of the gold mining expedition, Alalu means wave genetics. That is really how resonant waves affect DNA. When you look at science tells us that in 1953, it was Crick and Watson that, that, that discovered the double helix of DNA. But the Sumerians wrote that in the Enkin and Lil story. Enkin and Lil are the Shetty, the snake brothers, which is the intertwining double helix of DNA. Now you have Enki, who was positive, and you have Enlil, who was negative. Now on the double helix of DNA, you have positive twist and negative twist. It is talking about genetics. And Adamu, Tiamat, that they're, they're talking about the same thing as Adam and Eve. Adam is really our lowly nature on earth. And Eve, when you look at Eve, it comes from Shiva, Shiva, means serpent so when you are you know adam blamed eve and eve blamed the serpent what does that mean it means self-accusation when you start accusing yourself you then become the devil the diablos the accuser the false accuser you are we are basically now fallen from paradise we have fallen from that static state of mind we are now entering into division not beyond division it is all talking about the same things but as a different character, as a different thing. In relation to, are there underground cities beneath these monuments? Yes, of course there are. And did ancient people have, should we say, communions with extraterrestrials? Yes, they did. People now have communions with extraterrestrials. I've stood next to one, two feet away from someone, not of this world, six foot three with black eyes. You know, they exist. They have always been here. They are part of us. We are part of them. We are from the same universe. Mm-hmm. So yes, are they landing sites? Of course. Was that the purpose of them? No. If you go back to the beginning when I was saying about mathematically, they are given the coordinates of themselves and other monuments. The only reason that you need to give coordinates is for something to find you. Right. Right. So um, that's how it fits in with what it, what he's saying. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I want to get to come. I'm loving this. This is one of the most amazing shows you've had so thank you so much and it's like a lot to take best this is one of those shows you're going to watch over and over i'm going to get to some questions from some of our people um peg sutherland asks when our dna was originally changed was this why our consciousness was closed to the truth it's quite clear with when you look at science that is now coming from the eastern bloc the likes of russia and kazakhstan they are now starting to prove that human genetics was programmed outside of, of here. It's not from here. It is, they, they say that human language is basically a genetic expression. So genetics follows the same kind of structure that language has. Now, when you look at poetry, it has a, a sort of a metric structure. 
So our, our, our languages, the Earth languages, are an expression of, of inner DNA. Now, that is coming from science from the Eastern Bloc. When you look at other science that says that this human physical body is not from Earth either. Now, when a, a, a star explodes in the Orion Nebula, it creates carbon and oxygen called the triple alpha effect. That carbon and that oxygen is what we have as our physical bodies. So we are effectively a dead star. Okay. So there are so many references to stars in our language. If I tell you now to go and consider, that means now the stars. If I say there's going to be a disaster, that means a bad star. When we have a child, we call them a youngster, which is a young star. When we watch Hollywood, we look at A-listers. A-list stars are common stars. When we have prime ministers, that is a mini star. When we have masters, that means measurer of stars. They were basically astronomers. So if the human physical body is not from here, it's from Orion, and human genetics is not from here, it's come by solar winds and by panspermia and by other means to here, then we are clearly not native to this planet. We ended up here. It is clear that We've allowed the wrong people to be in charge. We've allowed the wrong people to take control of this planet and its resources. And it is quite clear that human DNA is suppressed. Human consciousness is suppressed. The human mind is suppressed. Human reality is suppressed. In effect, we are in a, a three-dimensional prison of five senses, seven colors, cannot exceed the speed of light because if we were to go faster than the speed of light in this body, our subatomic particles would separate and we would not have a body. So we are literally limited to the speed of light in a physical term, unless we are inside what is known as a warp bubble, which I've experienced, where you are protected from space. Now, a warp bubble contorts space behind you and expands space in front of you, which means effectively you can travel at the speed of light and faster, but you're not moving. You're basically encased in this, in this warp bubble, which, which NASA are now trying to replicate. But I have experienced that with various visitations from the past. So it's quite clear that every aspect of us, mind, body and spirit and genetically, has had limiters placed upon it. And that is really how they are suppressing our enlightenment. You know, we, we, we are not to become enlightened. We already are. We just need to return to that enlightened state that's been taken from us. So every aspect of our vessel, our reality, has been suppressed, mm. been suppressed. And everything that we can use to reverse that suppression has also been to, to a large extent taken from us you know pope gregory suppressed church music which was a which was which was a frequency that took you to a higher sanctity they suppressed it with gregorian uh, gregorian chants and and uh, every single they they changed the, the tone of music from 432 hertz to 440 deliberately everything that that we have in this reality is a suppression of some kind because those who wish to control us do not want us to realize what we really are. Now, why do they have the creation of outside beings and icons? Because it takes the sovereignty from the individual and gives it to the establishment. They can now control you by what these icons are telling you to do in your life. And your mind and your body and your life is controlled by these icons instead of the sovereignty of self. So our DNA has been manipulated it is manipulated and closed down. And they are that, that is really the, the some, some people call them archons, some people call them the control. They are by different names, but we have been closed down. Yes. But what I found with it with the universe is when something is put into a cycle, nothing, nothing can stop that motion. And as much as they try, they will not succeed. When I when I went back to the Great Pyramid of earlier, <clears throat> when you look at the Great Pyramid and the three pyramids of Giza, they represent the past, the present and the future. The Great Pyramid represents the future. There is a code that I've deciphered in the Great Pyramid that tells you the future of humanity is a golden age. So re regardless of what they try and do, it is all, the future has already been written. It is already won. Yeah. So fear not. Thank you. Um, a couple of last things. You talked about how the beginning is the end. I'm going to go back for a moment just because you brought up uh, so interesting for me about uh, the fact that you and I both were in this crop circle. Um, 
and hopefully uh, people can see it. I've brought it up to screen share. This is the Mayan calendar crop circle. This would have been from, this is, I think this was 2000 and 2009. 2009 is when we were there. Mm. Um, and uh, here's another picture of it. That's kind of cool. This shows uh, the frame from Silbury Hill. You can see how close it is just across from the highway. Um, but I love the idea that you were there and I was there. So who knows, we might've stood next to each other, <clears throat> Michael yes. and commented and who knows. And here we are 11 years later doing this show together. Um, of course, those were photographs taken by you know, airplanes from above, but hmm. it was, uh, we, we visited about a dozen crop circles, but that was the one that was the most remarkable uh, during the time that I happened to be there that summer. Hmm. <clears throat> So here's one, my last question for you, then I'll let you go, because I know we're already past an hour. How do you relate to the idea that there's everything you've laid out brilliantly from a mathematical, scientific, archetypal understanding? And then pulling back even further, do you relate to the idea that ultimately this is a dream world and we're all having our own individuated dreams within the consciousness of a great dream. Because that's of course also a common thought from some of our greater philosophers and spiritual teachers. So do you relate to that? And if so can you build a bridge between that way of thinking and the mathematical scientific perspective that you so brilliantly have studied and, and explained to us a little bit today? No, no one has, has ever defined, uh, defined what consciousness is. No one has ever defined what the mind is no one has really ever defined what what is this all about and it's pretty difficult from a human perspective to remember what you were now when, when you have certain people say that you know we come here with a veil of amnesia putting putting a science to that it is the interference patterns that are affecting memory what do i mean by interference patterns the only true reality is a wave now what we see i may look at a tree and I see a bark, I see branches, I see roots, which incidentally means secret, secret history. So you have the roots, which is the past, the bark, the present, the, uh, the branches that are the future. Uh, Druidism, Druid means knower of alt knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. I see a tree because that is what my brand is deciphered as a, as a real familiar world. If I could see beyond that bark, beyond, beyond those branches, I would see two patterns that are interfering with each other, that are creating a shape. <laughs> That is the true reality. It is not the tree. It is the interference patterns that are forming what we see as a as a an understandable, recognizable world. So no one really knows what it is. No one has ever seen the outside world. Can this be a dream? Yes. Could this be a simulation? Yes. If we ne if we never see the outside world, how do we know that an outside world exists? Right. Because we only ever see an interpretation of the wave. Now again. If somebody was to control that wave, we would see what they wanted us to see. So we can never be sure that this reality is, is a true reality. What are my opinions? I am on the trail of the meaning of life. And before I leave here, I, I, I'm quite sure I will find it. As I said earlier, we, as an undivided mind, we created all that that we experience all that we know and could this be that we've created it we experience it we live it because it was, it was thomas nagel that once said and, and words to the effect of you could understand every aspect of the workings of the brains of a bat but never know what it is like to be a bat mm -hmm. so in other words you don't know what it's like unless you've experienced it now how can you have perfection without the experience if if you had never tasted an apple how can i explain to you in words what it tastes like yeah. it's impossible yeah. you can only ever know what an apple tastes like if you've eaten an apple so in other words do we not have to experience what we've created to understand what we've created yeah that sounds and, and and that that is that is the kind of path that i would 
sort of flavour and go down. You know, you can't, you've created something, but you can't know what you've created unless you experience what it is you've created. That, right on. All right, well, I'm going to share with you my thought about the meaning of life, since that's, I am convinced that the meaning of life is we're here to learn to love, starting with ourselves. And what's really reinforced that, that, that idea first came about 20 years ago when I did a series of documentaries and television shows on near-death experiences. And I uh, worked with Dr. Kenneth Ring, who at the time was the world's foremost researcher. He was the Michael Feely of near-death experiences. Um, he was a psychologist, or is a psychologist, he's retired now, who had done clinical research and comparative analysis over a 10-year period of 300 legitimate cases of people who had had near-death experiences. He would only accept a case if the person had been declared dead by a doctor or a police officer. They had to have been dead for at least 20 minutes. They had to have some partial memory of what happened, and they had to be willing to be hypnotized by a professional hypnotist with Dr. Ring asking questions to probe the subconscious, which as you pointed out earlier is where we carry 90% of what happens. 300 cases worldwide, black, brown, yellow, white, Christian, Jew, atheist, you name it. When he started, he was an atheistic scientist trying to prove a theory um, that the brain is basically like a supercomputer and a near-death experience is just the supercomputer shutting down. 10 years later, he had a very different perception and had gone spiritual because of what he had observed, which was that almost every single person, regardless of their previous belief system, regardless of what their experience was, because the experience is really varied. Some people saw deceased relatives. Some people saw the big golden light. Some people, you know, just hovered above their bodies. But when it came to the meaning of life, whether it was Jesus showing it to them or another archetypal figure or a deceased relative or the golden light, when they had that experience of being shown or remembering the meaning of their life, it was always a variation on the theme I'm here to learn to love, starting with myself. Now, each person had their own challenge. I'm here to learn to love myself, even though I lost my legs in the car accident, even though I'm an alcoholic, even though my father beat me, even though my wife left me. You know, everybody had their challenges of I'm here to learn to love myself, despite a disillusionment or wounding or whatever psychological thing it might be. But I really do believe that that's the meaning of life. And during the 20 years that I've been coaching people, and I've coached thousands of people at this point, um, you can see it as we get to know people. And as a coach, I get to know people intimately. You see where, oh, they're here to learn to love themselves, even though they're obese, even though whatever their particular challenge is. So I'll offer to you, Michael, since you're curious about the meaning of life, to, to play with that. What is the meaning of life? Is each of us and it fits right into what you were saying, because we're here to experience ourself. And we are, you know, we started in um, paradise, or as you described it, you know, beautifully. We started there and we're probably going back there through the journey of polarity, through the journey of being in the, the cage of a human body, where we have these limitations and this perception that we're separate from each other. And then we go back into the, the experience of oneness, but we get there through the experience of love, learning compassion for ourselves, compassion for each other. So anyway, that's my thought, and I'd love to hear how it <clears throat> resonates for you. I think it does, because there is no greater force, there is no greater purpose than you, and <clears throat> everything else is a reflection upon you or a reflection of you. And every, everyone else is a variation of you. So when you, how do you get a circle? You know, it, it is minimum length, maximum energy. That gives you the circle. We, we are the creators of this because we were the original undivided mind that created this. So therefore, we have to have created this. Everything in, in society today is geared to taking you away from yourself. Mm -hmm. Every aspect of your reality takes you away from yourself. When you start to realize your, what yourself is capable of, 
you know, there are there are surgeons in the Philippines that are able to make incisions by the power of the mind. There are people who are able to do these superhuman feats with their mind. They are not any different to the rest of us. We are all superhuman potential. We've just been closed down or we've just forgot. But there is no greater cause than you. And you are God. God is you. Whatever your God is, is not the God of religion. Please don't think that's what I mean. But, but, but the true God, you are the true God. And all of these ancient cultures, this is what they are telling you. You are this shining light beam that is part of the original creation that can return to that original creation. You are not separate from anything else. The separation comes from reality testing. When a child is is born into this world, there is no separation. They see everything as one. Now, when when a child gets to a certain age, and, and I've looked at child psychology and I've looked at, looked at all these things, when they get to a certain age, that is when what is known as reality testing, which is, which is a, a fragment of ego, they start to separate themselves from the rest of the world. This is my body, this is not, that is that separation. But what we see as separation, there is no such thing as separation because there is no such thing as empty space. When you look at contradictory science that tells you that the Casimir effect proves that physical objects can be messed with and, and, and manipulated inside a vacuum, well, in that case, what is what, what are physical objects doing in a vacuum? They shouldn't be there. So on the one hand, they're telling you that the vacuum has nothing in there. But then on the other hand, they're telling you that the Casimir effect can control physicality inside a vacuum. There is no such thing as empty space. You know, the, the, the 99.9999% empty space around atoms, for argument's sake, for me, is the intelligent field that observes them into existence. There is no such thing as, as Say space. Say that again. Say that again slowly, because that... That's powerful. It's just, I mean, everything you're saying is powerful, but I want to really anchor that in. So say that last bit about the 99.9% spaces. We, we as humans, everything in our reality is not solid. It just has the appearance of solidity. Everything is 99.99999% empty space. That includes the atom. For me, that 99.9999999% empty space around the atom is an intelligent field that observes the atom into existence. There is no such thing as, as distance. There's no such thing as empty space. If you can travel at the speed of light, space and time and distance become zero. So the, the start of your journey is the end of the journey. And the end of the journey is the start. The beginning is the end. The end is the beginning. Everything comes from you. Everything stems from you. And everything is a reflection of you. When you start to realize your own power, when you start to realize that by certain, for argument's sake, by certain breathing techniques, you can alkalize the body, which gets rid of cancers, gets rid of all of these different diseases. You don't need medications. You just need yourself. You just need your mind. You just need the right focus in order to do that. So everything comes from you. If you can love yourself, if you are happy in your own company, everything else is a bonus. But you, you are the monad. You are the fixed point of nothing that became everything. Michael, I am so grateful. Um, I am going to pull up how people can learn more about you. Um, here's uh, your promotional postcard. So, hey, everybody, let's support Michael. Um, if you go to his website, www.michael-feely, F-E-E-L-E-Y.com, uh, michael-feely.com, or you can email him, michael at michael-feely.com. And, um, you know, even on his card, what it says, there's an ancient code that has been left for humanity that unveiled could change everything. I have deciphered it. And I feel like you've given us so much, uh, obviously last night and so much today, Michael. I, I feel like I've just had Thanksgiving came two weeks later because this is the biggest delicious meal of wisdom and knowledge that I now need to digest. And I think people watching need to digest. And people tend to watch um, 
my show uh, later on. Uh, the majority of people tend to watch the video replay. Um, this will go up on the Global Peace Tribe YouTube channel, uh, so people can find it that way as well. I'll also send you a copy of the YouTube link, uh, which we'll make tomorrow. Um, Michael, how can people support you? What would you like for people to know that would support you and your work and your efforts? I think, I think again, uh, if anyone's interested in, in what I've said, just have a look at the website. There's, there's free stuff on there as well. There's, there's blogs. There's all different things on there that, that can set people on, on their journey. How can they support me? By questioning. By questioning everything. And then it makes what I'm doing worthwhile. God bless you. I sure hope we get to connect again. I really, I so have enjoyed my time with you. And um, and God's blessings to you, your wife, and your six-year-old daughter. And I, I look forward to hopefully our next connection. Thank you so much. Thank you. You take care. Thanks very much. All right. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Take care.